Well, first of all, welcome for the our first lesson of Python for Scientists. I'm going to explain to you why I'm calling Python for Science in this course and not Python programming. Uh, just to present myself, I'm just a student, PhD student as you, and I also work for the Brazilian National Water Agency, ANA. I'm a water specialist there, and I've been working for more than 15 years in the IT department of ANA. And I'm doing this course mostly to, to help you guys to achieve the results you need for the, for the thesis to treat data and this kind of stuff. So, at the very first beginning, uh, I have just five slides, it's just, just really quick, and then we, we'll, jump into the, we'll jump into the programming language, okay? Uh, if you have any questions, you can stop me at any time to put your, your questions, or you can write here in the, in the chat, I, I have it open here, no problem. So the first thing I would like to, to talk to is why learn programming? I don't know if everyone has seen the short video that I have sent, uh, I think it was really interesting. Uh, but uh, the, the, the most important thing that we can get from this video, I think, is that we can see a lot of uh, personalities in the industry, like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or the creator of Dropbox that are really, uh, really uh, great and big tech companies. And all of them started with this. So it, it, it's cool in the, in the video that they say, wow, the very first programming I wrote, uh, it, it, it would just print a message in the, in the screen or it would just draw a circle. And that's how everyone starts. So we, we just start with a blanking, with a blanking cursor. And then we can do whatever we want with programming. For example, we can do what we are doing here. There is science. We can do, for example, finance or we can do things more complicated. For example, we can do art, we can do music or Nowadays, the, the, the films are completely uh, done using uh, avatars, and it's completely digital. And at the very, uh, at the end, we can still teach computers how to do stuff that we, we do and how to become more intelligent. I have done a presentation in, in the university uh, about uh, uh, deep learning that I have been using for satellite image at the, at the very beginning of my thesis. I'm not using it anymore, but uh, I was using to detect water and to detect clouds. And it's, I think it's the next barrier of, uh, of computing and programming. But the cool thing about the video and, and the insight I would like to leave for you is that everything starts with a blank, blank prompt, like this one. And I put the, the green one because I really started with the green one. <laughs> it's not so common nowadays, but that's how everything starts. And why Python for science, not Python programming? Well, the idea here, in, in, well, at least in, in this first module or this first part of the course, uh, as I was explaining for the other guys uh, at the beginning, uh, my idea is to have like four or five classes, lessons, and then see if you need something more deeper in one package or uh, another. So we can maybe select one, one project, a little project to go from the beginning to the end to show you how to, to develop everything. Uh, that would be nice also. But the main idea is not to make you uh, actually programmers, but uh, use Python as a tool. What do I mean? Uh, we need to learn how to use the package, how to load data, how to transform, to visualize, to analyze, how to do basic automation. For example, you have, if you have to deal with a lot of files, with a lot of text or with a lot of data, uh, CSV, and then we, we have to know how to deal with that and to visualize this data and how to, to analyze this data, okay? Uh, it's not actually a programming course. For programming, we have to learn a lot of other concepts related to software engineering classes and best practice and testing, debugging, 
Uh, and, uh, well, as I know, maybe some of you are willing to, to learn also these things, but uh, to start, we need to start with the basics. And the basic, I think, is this one. For those, for example, who use R or who use MATLAB, uh, you will learn Python the same way you use MATLAB or R. So you can do simple scripts, for example. It's not to develop a whole system from the beginning to the end. Okay? <clears throat> so that's the, the main idea of the course. And why Python? That's another good question. One, because it's free. I know, for example, who use MATLAB. MATLAB is not free. Uh, it's really easy to use. It's high level. Uh, for those who, who are not, uh, who doesn't understand exactly the, the nomenclature, but high level language is the language closer to the user, to the programmer, and not closer to the to the hardware, so we can have uh, uh, levels of the le or layers, and the highest level is the closer to our understanding to the programmer, and not to the machine uh, code. Well, Python is being largely used in the academia, especially for data science, machine learning, and deep learning, and it's modular. I'm gonna show you why it's so important to understand why Python is modular in the next slide. But before going there, I'd like to just show you, this is a graph I did in Google Trends that shows in uh, 2018, uh, in the middle of 2018, Python surpassed uh, Java as the main programming language being searched in the internet. Okay, uh, I was reading another article that shows Python is being used to hire people even in the big techs. For example, uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, they are also hiring uh, Python programmers to their staff. So I think it's a, it's a good reason to learn Python for, for, for that and for the other reasons. Uh, the PhD students who are willing to look for a job after, <laughs> I think it's a good bet. To, to learn this. Let's talk a little bit about Python packages. Well, <clears throat> one of the reasons I told you Python is interesting to learn is because it's modular. And that's because it has a concept of packages. <clears throat> the Python packages are pieces of software that we can use as a tool. They are developed by the community, so we have packages done by a lot of different uh, programmers or researchers for, to do a lot of different stuff. For example, here I, I, I show this is a package that I have created myself at the beginning, the first year of the PhD. It's the Water Detect. I am now in the version 1.5.10. I forgot to update here. But uh, just to show you that anyone can create a package and to be shared to, to everyone in the world. And these packages, they are installed in a, in a repository uh, that is official, that is the Python package index. We can also have other repositories, but this is the, the probably the, the, the most important one that uh, we are going to, to take a look at. And the important thing here is that from Python, this is the symbol of Python, the two snakes, we can do everything we want using different packages. So Python is really just a small core. It's, it's, the, it's the programming language and it's the syntax. But for example, if you'd like to do imaging processing, uh, RGB, we can use PIL. It's this other uh, symbol here. That is the Python imaging library. Or if you'd like to work with matrices, it's NumPy. Or if you'd like to work with data frames, it's Pandas or machine learning, scikit learning, or deep learning. We have uh, TensorFlow from Facebook, or sorry, this one is PyTorch from Facebook, or TensorFlow from uh, Google. If you'd like to work with satellite images, we have GEDAL. If you'd like to use any dimensional arrays with labels in the dimensions and split them to, to, 
to better performance, we can use X-Array or Folium to show the maps, or you can use SciPy to make a regression or to use more mathematical stuff. So uh, we have packages for almost everything that we would like to do in Python, almost everything. And that brings us to the rule number one. The, the one thing that I'm calling rule number one is that don't start doing anything without looking for a specific package first. Uh, it's very common when we learn some uh, new tool and we think we can solve everything with that uh, tool uh, and start developing. No, oh, I, I learned how to develop to make the, a function, so I'm going to develop everything to solve my problem. What I'm telling you is that, uh, okay, it's nice that you, you know how to do it, but you have to first, you should first look for a specific package because really, we have package for almost everything. If we go to PyPI, there's the repository, we have more than 300,000 packages registered uh, now. Uh, and it's huge. Uh, and it can be overwhelming at a time, for example, we can really transform our environment in something like this. It's it becomes really difficult to manage all these packages because they are so many and so many. And that brings us to the rule number two. Don't install anything until you learn how to manage the environment. And that's something we'll be learning maybe on lesson number three. I will explain you why. Uh, because it would take me uh, a lot of time to teach you how to install an environment and how to... <clears throat> correctly download the package, how to check the dependencies and all this stuff. So uh, what I'm planning to do with you guys is a little bit different. Uh, we are going to start with a online tool called Google Collab. It's from Google and it's free. And we can do a lot of uh, machine learning and data science in Google Collab. Okay, and the, the biggest advantage of using Google Collab is that uh, we don't have to bother installing the, the kernel, the, the main Python, or many of the packages. If there is one or other package that we still need and it's not provided, we can quickly install just that package. But uh, <clears throat> for, for everything else, it's probably already installed. And... Uh, there are some drawbacks of using Google Collab that I can explain you afterwards, but it's mainly on the data, because if you need the data to, to process a lot of data, for example, satellite images, we have to upload everything to Google Collab, uh, to a Google Drive. It's not Google Collab, it can connect to a Google Drive, but we have to, to upload to Google Drive or maybe a Dropbox to, to an online provider to... <coughs> To do the processing, but if you are working just with uh, with tabular data, uh, it, it's, it's really fast and uh, easy to use. Okay, so uh, we are starting with Google Collab. What I was explaining, so uh, using Google Collab, we have everything already installed, and we don't have to to bother installing these packages. The other good thing about Google Collab is that it has been built around Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks is what makes Python really uh, interactive. Uh, of course, there are other uh, ways of using Python interactively, for example, IPython, but it's not as cool as uh, Jupyter Notebook. <clears throat> but that, that's a, a great thing about Python that uh, uh, we have it interactive. And to explain you what is that, uh, it brings the programming language closer to what is called literate programming. The literate programming is a paradigm introduced by Donald Knuth in 1992 in the University of Stanford, if, if I remember correctly. And it's simple. The concept is really simple. It's just like this. So uh, the idea is to have in one, uh, in the same uh, media, for example, a notebook, we can have documentation, 
pieces of code and results everything together so we can bring code to a, a, a higher level of explanation and understanding because we, we can really write stuff and we can really uh, write the formulas and we can run small pieces of code and interactively see the, see the results. Uh, for those who are used to R or MATLAB, they, have, they are really uh, uh, cool and they were used a lot because of this characteristic of being interactive. And uh, Python now has, it's not now, but from uh, 2014, if I remember well, but uh, it also permits us to, to do a, a complete program from the beginning to the end. So that's what makes Python so interesting. So because we can really navigate, for example, from this interactive uh, uh, thing to uh, uh, com write a complete chain of processing uh, in, a, in, a, in a program. There are even packages to write games in Python. It's PyGame is one of, of them. I was teaching uh, my son how to just the basics of using it. And it's really cool. Okay, now uh, I will quit the presentation. It was just that. I will open uh, Google Collab. As I was talking to Tai, uh, we have two options here. You, you can open, but I think the best option would be to follow because I will type the commands really quickly. And the, the notebook will be available for you to afterwards uh, see or to test by yourselves if it's uh, nice or not. So let me open yeah. the notebook. We are going to Google Collab. This is the notebook lesson one. And I'm not going to start with the notebook. I'm going to start with a new notebook, completely new. <clears throat> uh, we have to wait a, a little bit for the notebook to connect. Okay. So it's connected. And as I was explaining, the idea is that uh, in this environment, in this notebook, we have cells. We can add more cells. Each one of these are cells and we can have text. Okay, we have two different types of cells, text and code. Uh, Google Colab is a little bit different from Jupyter, but it's just the, the shortcuts. So if I type something wrong here, it's because I'm used to using my notebook in my own computer and in Golab is different, but uh, it's not so, so, so different. So in, in, in the text cell, we can write everything we want. For example, the hello world and does nothing, just displays. And in, in, uh, in the code, we can put code. And to run the code, we have to uh, push this button or shift enter. So shift enter is the most important thing that we are going to use in, <clears throat> in Google Collab or in a Jupyter notebook to run the cell, okay? So uh, a notebook starts like this one completely blank. I'm going back to my notebook. The notebook that will be available for you is this one, Python for Science uh, uh, Lesson 1. <clears throat> Here I can show you a little bit uh, different content in the Python, in the Markdown cell. The Markdown cell is the text cell. Okay, uh, just would like to highlight to you that we can put, for example, latex uh, formulas. We can put uh, HTML. We can also include images, for example. And uh, I'm not going to explain now how to do this stuff. Uh, you can quickly search, but uh, we are going to focus in, in coding and in the, in the syntax of Python. But as we are, we are moving on, we are going to learn some of the tricks to, to do this. And the other important thing that I'm going to teach you is that we can have headers. So uh, I can say first part and for the headers we have to start with the hashtag and the number of hashtags 
defines the level of the header uh, subpart, for example, like this. Okay, and we can fold and unfold these uh, <coughs> these titles. Uh, okay, following on. The other thing is that we can also uh, write text in a code cell, putting the hashtag inside a code cell. In this case, I can put a quick note just to help understanding. Uh, sorry, this is just a message saying that is this notebook was created by someone else, not Google, and I would like to run anyway. <coughs> okay, you are going to encounter this, this message as well. And, uh, okay, so we can also write some comments directly inside the code. <coughs> Every time I write any code in a Jupyter notebook, and that's important, uh, the code that is in the last line, if it returns something, it will be displayed automatically by the, the kernel. So, for example, if I just type a arithmetic operation like 6 plus 2, it returns me 8, or 2 plus 2, it returns me 4, and so on. <clears throat> okay? Okay, that's the first part. That's just uh, the, the notebook. Getting to know the notebook. Okay, you can play with this. I'm not going to spend too much time here because I, I, <clears throat> I don't know. That's the most important for you to understand. That is something you can you can learn by yourselves. The oh, I created the first part and now it is bringing me a, a little problem that I'm going to del delete the cell I just created. Okay, great. <clears throat> Uh, one of the reasons I'm calling this, this course Python for Science is not Python programming at all. Uh, I have searched a lot of uh, different material online and usually <coughs> uh, the courses start to teaching how to make a, a, a loop in the programming or how to make really simple or explaining what is a function. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, as science, we have probably logic uh, classes in the university and we already know a lot of this uh, stuff and then uh, I'm going to pass through it uh, quick. So if you are not comfortable with any of these concepts, you can just uh, raise your hand or, or make the questions and then uh, I can stop and, and explain. <coughs> but uh, we are going to, to flow as as quick as possible to display some uh, real results that I'm going to show at the end of the, the class. The other thing is that uh, I'm not going to, to teach you the whole fundamental stuff to show the results. I'm going, uh, uh, I will go back and forth uh, because I think it's good to, to, for the understanding to show a real example. So I'm not going to cover all the, the basics. So for those who are watching, oh, numbers, I don't want to learn what is an integer. I'm not going to explain what is an integer is, but it's just for you to, <clears throat> to understand. I'm going to pass really quick by the, the basic structures of Python. And then I'm going to show the example. And the next class, we return to the, the, the structures that I haven't uh, teach uh, today. <clears throat> okay, so in Python, we can have some basic types. I'm calling part one because in the next lesson I will be <coughs> showing uh, more uh, examples. And we can have, for example, integers, we can have real numbers. And in computer science, we call real numbers as float numbers. That's important to, to, to know the <coughs> how they are called. Sometimes we have to convert from integer to float. The most basic uh, structure is uh, binary, and we call them Boolean. It can be true or false. Uh, we can have some more complex numbers in Python, for example, co complex numbers. Uh, they exist, for example, if I put 2 plus 4j, uh, it's not uh, uh, the answer. It will not try to, to add up uh, 2 and 4. It returns me uh, a complex number. But it, it's something that maybe some of you uh, will use it, but it's not so common for 
for us. Okay, so these are the very basic uh, data types that we're going to, to use, excluding the complex. And uh, to see that the, the thing that he's displaying, that the, the, the notebook is displaying, is really a complex number, we can use a function. Okay, and Python has a lot of internal functions, and one of the, the most important functions that we're going to, to learn is type. Type returns me the type of something that it receives. So I'm passing a complex number, it's returning me uh, the, the, the name of this type of complex. For example, another important thing, if I type, if I type type, uh, the, the function, if I call the type function for the number two and for the number two point, there are two different types for Python. One is two integer and the other one is two uh, float. Okay, uh, Python takes care of managing these internally very, in a very reasonable way. For example, it can, we can mix types. For example, here, I'm using uh, an integer and another integer and I'm dividing them and the result is returning as a float as we would expect, uh, okay? So it understands automatically that I'm uh, uh, making a computation using two different uh, data types, but these data types, we, we can use an operation on these. If it's not possible to operate, it's going to raise an error. And we can see in the, in the following example when I talk about strings. We are going through the arithmetic operations. Uh, we are not going to spend too much time here uh, to just show you that we have the very basics, plus, minus, uh, product, and division. And we have other uh, more interesting, for example, the modulus, that's the reminder of the division. Uh, for example, if I type 13 modulus 5, we receive 3. Print is another function that we have to learn. <coughs> We are going to use a lot. Print is just to display the result. As I told you, it displays me only the result in the last line. So for example, if I try to repeat this here, 13 and then 13 modulus 5, great. It's going to show me just 3 because he just outputs the, the last line. Okay, so if you'd like to see more results, we need to use print. <coughs> We have also the floor division, if you would like just the integer part of a division. It's two slashes. Uh, we have also exponents. For those who are not used to programming, uh, it's very important, the operator's precedence. So two times two to the exponent of two is different from two times two in parentheses to the exponent of two to the square. One, the, the result is eight, the other, the result is 16. And why is that? Because the exponent is the, the higher precedence or the higher priority when computing. So the graph that it uses internally to, to solve this equation is, it first uses the, the higher precedence the higher priority, it will solve the, the exponent and then it will solve here. But the good thing about uh, the interactive programming is that we can quickly see the result and see that we are doing something really wrong in our, <laughs> in our computation. Okay, this is the, the, the basic arithmetic operations that we were planning for today. And the other kind of operations are the comparison operators. So the comparison operators, they return always a Boolean true or false. For example, uh, two different from three, it's true. And we have the equality, difference, greater than, lower than, greater or equal, lower or equal. Okay, so these are the, the very basic comparison. And we have also as a result, a true or a false, okay? 
Another thing that we, 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 we use a lot when programming is that uh, we can have to understand true and false as an integer instead of a boolean. Uh, so, for example, if I would like to change the, the data type of a variable in Python, we can use the name of the data type uh, as a function. So if I use the name of the data type as a function and pass the number I want here, it will return me uh, the, the result in that data type. So for example, I'm using here one greater than two, of course it will return false. <clears throat> I can do it here. So what it is, what is it doing here? It's just converting false to uh, integer and zero. So that's another thing that we have to be aware of is that uh, true is always converted to one and false always converted to uh, zero. Okay. Uh, for example, if I'd like to convert true, oops, sorry, true, it will be converted to uh, true. Okay, and it works for other types like this. For example, I passed an integer, I convert it to float, and the result's not 2, it's 2.0, because it makes clear uh, that we are talking about a real number, a float, and not an integer. Another good thing is that we can uh, compare uh, different data types. And they can behave differently if we are comparing different data type. But for numbers, it will work most of the time as we expect them to work. For example, if I check if 123 is greater than 122.99, uh, the result will be, of course, true. Okay? And uh, we can also make a comparison of objects with different uh, uh, types. Here I'm putting a string. I will explain string uh, in the following uh, section, but it can work. I can compare. For example, if I try to compare 123 with 123 under uh, quotation marks, uh, it returns me false because internally it's different. This is a string. I'm going to talk about the string, and this is just the number 123, an integer, okay? And, uh, but if it happens, and it will happen to you when you are programming, because that's something that happens a lot when programming in Python, and we have to convert uh, from text to number and to float and to string. For example, if you are reading a text file with a lot of data, uh, to convert, we can just use it. As I told you, we can put the, the num name of the, the data type as a function. When I say as a function, it's putting uh, inside the, the parentheses the argument I'm passing. So the argument I'm passing is a string. When I do this, just to show you, if I do this, I will convert 2, 3, 4 from string to the integer one, uh, 234. <clears throat> okay, and then we can compare them. Uh, ah, another question that may arise from you is, okay, what if I try to compare this with the string directly? Like uh, uh, lower than, it cannot solve. And when it cannot solve, it will raise what we call an exception. An exception is an error, and uh, it will show us uh, the, the, the reason of this error. So uh, it's not implemented, this operator, for these two different data types that we have on the left and on the right. So it's not possible to solve <coughs> this sentence, OK? Uh, After the comparison operators, uh, I, I teach you that uh, the comparison operators, they always return me true or false. 
I, uh, that you understood correctly. And now we have to learn about the logical operators. It's, it's very interesting and important also. So the logical operators are basically and uh, that we are going to use uh, at the moment and or and then not just to, to deny. <coughs> okay. So for example, if I would like to solve to this equation or this logical operation uh, to lower than five and three lower than four, it will return true regardless the parentheses. And why is that? Because of the precedence. Usually the logical operators are, have the lowest precedence of all operators. So uh, it will always solve something in one side and then you try to check the logic to check if it's true or false. <coughs> uh, so we have and, not, and or. <coughs> not is just to deny, it's just to make the inverse. For example, if I put not true, <coughs> it gives me false, okay? Uh, and or, uh, it returns uh, true when any of the, the, those sides are true. If you have any doubts in, in, uh, in these logic operators, I, I don't think so. I probably everyone already have seen these in the universe or any other uh, boring logic class. So I, I'm not to spend time explaining you the other operators, for example, uh, sure that is the exclusive or, or left shift or right shift. And these are bitwise operators and then they operate in the bit not in the, in, the, in the final result of the variable that we are working on. Okay, so, uh, so I'm not going to, to spend time teaching you this part. But if you are interested, I'm going to leave it here in the, in the notebook for you. If you think you, you will never use it in, in your academic uh, journey, be advised that Sometimes it's important, for example, when we are dealing with uh, satellite images to mask, for example, the Heister image for clouds. I have written an article on Medium that explains how to, uh, how is it possible to, to, to use these kind of operations to, to apply different level of masking in an image. Okay, sometimes the, the results from the satellite, they come in, in, uh, in the bits. But I'm not going in this uh, subject now. And a reminder, if you need some of these uh, subjects for your specific project or for your uh, thesis, just let me know and then we can, of course, we can explain. But for example, to explain this, I have to explain the binary numbers and I have to explain how does it work, how is the result for, from the satellite, a lot of more complex uh, uh, stuff. And for this first class, I would like to, to skip this. Okay. The other data type that we have is the string. The string is a connection of uh, letters and numbers or anything else that we would like to, to put here. And one interesting thing about the string is that the computer, it doesn't try to solve the string. So it's just a string for it. So that's something I have already showed you that if I put one, two, three, it's not one, two, three, so I cannot add up with an integer, okay? It's just the, the, it's not 123, it's just one, two, and three, three letters, okay? Let me go back to my hello world example. Ah, I, I had this example here, five plus two is simply five plus two, okay? It doesn't solve a string. 
but we can do operation with the strings some operation for example if I use the add operator uh, it will add it will concatenate the strings for example if I write some some up hello and world we will end with a complete string with the two parts and it can also compare strings if I try to to check if the strings are the same if I put an exclamation mark it will return false and to check alphabetical order uh, it works so it's uh, important because the alphabetical order that is being assessed here so if I see if Jan is greater than Albin, Alban, uh, it will return true because of the J. And that's interesting because sometimes we'll get bugs in your code because you will try to solve something like 99 uh, is then. And you say, no, of course it's true. No, it's false because internally it's not understanding what you're passing as an integer or as a float or as a number. It's in understanding as a string. And you will certainly uh, go through uh, errors like this one, especially if you are working with data that is in Excel sheets or uh, uh, text files, CSV files, because usually when we import these, if you have just one item that is not uh, uh, a number, it will convert everything to string, and then you think you are computing on strings and on, on numbers, and in fact you are computing on strings. <coughs> okay, so this is alphabetic order that is being compared here with this uh, operator. Okay. Uh, another thing is that some operators are really not defined for strings. For example, I cannot uh, uh, subtract a letter from a string. If I try to do this, it doesn't work. <clears throat> okay, it doesn't work. There are other ways to do this kind of stuff and compare a string to a number. As I already told you, it's not possible. Be careful because if I just put string, it will give me a result, but remember, it's comparing string to another string, so it's alphabetical order. It's not the the, the quantity that is being uh, compared here. Now we have seen the basic numbers and the basic string, but just that. And we saw that in notebook we can solve. So I can solve something like. Uh, any number that that would like, but that does that's not much different from a calculator. So when I was uh, explaining to 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 my son, he he just asked me, okay, but I can do everything in the calculator, and I said, so yes. Up to now, you are you are you are sure that we we can do everything in the calculator. But here in variables, is that things starts to get more interesting for the computer programming is that because we can store the results and we can put the results and use them in other computations and to declare a variable in in, uh, in python is as simple as using any name that we we want the only constraint is that we cannot use a number before the the letter we can use a number just after the letter so for example if i define a2 and b a2 is will be an int and b will be a float as we are expecting so we don't have to tell python what is the data type that we want it just guess and normally it guesses correctly okay so for those who are used to other languages, I know Ibrahim, he, he, he told me he had a C++ classes. So for example, for C, you have to define and you have to say it's an int and it's immutable. 
it never it can never change from int to another data type and you have to allocate memory so here we don't have to bother with any of these uh, stuff we just put a name the equal and in this case this equal is the assignment operator what we call assignment operator okay so 23 7 so we have an interfloat and now we can do anything all the operations that we have seen using these variables okay s is hello world if i would like to print s and if i like to see the type of s s is a string great and i can do the comparison operations as well okay very fast very easy <clears throat> now things will get a little more interesting when we talk about lists and lists are really powerful tools in uh, in python okay uh, lists uh, what is important here is to keep in mind that lists are ordered so it maintains the order of the items when we insert them in, in the list it never changed the order it accepts duplicates so we can uh, put a, a duplicated item in, in the in the list uh, that's the difference from, li from list to a set. A set, it cannot, uh, a set cannot have duplicates. So if you put a duplicate in a set, uh, uh, it just gets rid of the duplicates. And the list in Python can contain different data types. That's another difference, I think, from MATLAB, because from MATLAB, uh, the, the match, I think it's a matrix that has, must have the same data types. I am not, I don't remember well, but I, I know there are some constraints in some other language for this and for, for the list in python no, we can have any any data type so for example here we have i have defined the list and to define a list we have to use the square brackets for example here i have the number one and then the word hello and then 3.5 there is a float another integer and then just to show you i have another list and then the number six okay so if I define, I will call LST uh, as my list and I put in the last line of a cell. Uh, Jupyter Notebook will just give me the result and it's my list. So it accepts normally, we don't have any problem. I can use this other uh, internal command to see uh, the length of the list. So we have six elements. In the list six elements so if we count like this one two three four five six seven uh, we will get an error because we don't have seven we have six because this list here is interpreted as uh, one element of course it's the element list so we can have lists inside of lists and inside of lists and we can create a multi-dimensional uh, structure using lists I'm gonna show you at the end of this of this lesson. Uh, I will delete this and I will, okay, so I, I just show you how to create a list. Okay, but what can we do with a list? And we can do a lot of interesting stuff with the list. The, the first thing we, we, we have to learn about the list is how to index the list. It's called list indexing. What is list indexing? List indexing is a way to refer to the individual item of a list, individual only. So when I talk about indexing, I'm talking about selecting one item of the list, okay? Not a subset. Subset is slicing. It's another term that you have to learn because when you look for uh, help in the internet for something you are doing, there is a difference, index and slice. So we have two different ways to deal with it so if i'm indexing a list uh, i just need to put a square brackets just after the list i have created so for example if i put lst and just after under inside the square brackets the zero i will get the very first item of the list and that's another difference from Python to R, for example, because the first item is has index zero. So it's important to, to know this. So Python indexing is zero-based, what we call zero-based, so it's zero. Uh, 
uh, and we can we can count backwards so if we use minus one we we are referring to the last item in the list okay so we have the first one and the last one let's check with our list our list is here the last one and the very first one okay uh, but you, you may be questioning yourselves if there is not a, a, another possibility to access the last one. Of course it is. As I told you, uh, it's zero-based and we have six items. So the last one will be index number five. So if I type list uh, inside the brackets five, will bring me the sixth uh, item in the list. Okay, that's really important, uh, that's crucial for any uh, scientific work that we would like to do in Python, because the same indexing we are doing with the list will be the, the notation we will use for a matrix, okay, for a matrix or matrices. Uh, so <coughs> it's really important to understand these types. So, for example, if I would like to get the second and penultimate items, we can use LST1 and LST-2. So, we are getting the second, let's check, second, it's here, and we'll have the penultimate is our list. Okay, so it returned correctly our list. Okay, it's returning our list. And here I uh, have to, uh, here I will introduce one thing that I, it was expected for lesson two, but it's really quick. Uh, I'm using uh, this common here just to make it easier or quicker for us to, to see the results. Uh, when I use a comma inside, uh, between two variables or three or four, it doesn't matter. What it does automatically, it creates a new uh, structure that is called a tuple. A tuple. I will explain tuples in the in the in the next uh, in the next class. But a tuple, uh, it's like a list, but it's represented inside parentheses, and it's not immutable. I will talk about this. It's not. Uh, uh, it's not immutable, it's immutable. You cannot change the items of a tuple and we can change the items of a list. I'm going to show you this difference. So that's why I'm using this comma just to make it easier. But internally it's creating tuples. I don't want you to, to be concerned about it. Let's talk about slicing. Uh, so slicing, let's go back is a way to refer to subset items within a list. Okay, to access subset items within a list, what do we do? We just put the first index and the last index, not exactly the last one, because, for example, if I uh, in, in set, if you remember uh, the math class of sets, we have the closed and the open, for example, like this, if I would like to as, uh, <coughs> a continuous series from 1 to 10, this is the representation that includes the number 1, this is the representation where it's open in 10, I don't know if you remember this from, from math, uh, so uh, in a series like this it will go from 1 to 9.999999, but never touch the 10. Okay, it's a limit. Uh, if you are talking about floats, if you are talking about integers, uh, it will go to 9. Okay, so uh, we have a similar concept here in Python, and when we try to slice, it starts with the first item or the first index, so it starts with 0. I think I'm going to split this in two to make it clear for you. I think it's too complex to explain like this. Let me put this one here. <coughs> it will bring us open here. So it will not include the index number three. It will stop uh, in one index before. 
so it will bring us the zero index, the first or the second item, but the index one, and it will bring us index two. So the first, second, and third items. If I if I pass or if I write a, sli a slice like this, the same happens from three to six. It will bring me item number three, uh, index number three, index number five, no four, and index number five. That is the last index in my list. Okay, so that's also important because, as I told you, matrices are working with this notation. It may seem awkward uh, at first, but you will see that it's not. If we would like to combine different pieces of our matrix, it's uh, more normal if we use like this because we can stop, for example, if I have a list with six, like our list has six, I can ask it to bring from the very first to the to the fourth item or to, to the fourth index and then we can restart from this one to the end. And I didn't skip any of these and the four is the same. Okay, if we use other notation that includes the first and the last one, I have to, in the loops, I have to take care to put a plus one here and that makes it more difficult to write the code. So it seems awkward at the, at the, at the first glance, but it's not. You will see that it's really nice uh, notation once we get used to it. If you are not used to it, it's difficult, but once you are used to it, it's good. Okay, uh, the last thing I, I'm gonna, I'd like to show you about the list, of course, uh, uh, I don't know why is it here, because of my kid, probably, but okay. Ah, no, it was, no, no, sorry, I, I undo the delete. Okay, if I get the, the penultimate item, you remember there is a list. The penultimate item of our list is a list, and we can do indexing in that list. So, for example, we can put two index after my variable. Uh, list minus two is a list, and then I would like the first item that is a string. Very well. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't think we have uh, uh, any difficulty here. Uh, I have to understand that this first comment that is being processed, it's returning a list. And then if it's a list, I could, I could call, for example, uh, list two. And then what I'm doing in this new uh, line here is list two, uh, first item. Is the first item of the inner list of my list. I call the inner list item one. Okay. So instead of uh, naming or creating a new variable, calling it list two, I can just put everything and concatenate everything together to get the result I want. And it's not only that, uh, but we can also use slicing or indexing with the strings. So this item that it's returning here, it's a string. And if I would like, for example, to get the five last terms, the word item one, I can index like this, uh, list minus two, zero, the first item of the sublist, minus five to the end. When I put the, the two points uh, without any index, it goes from here to the end. And the same works the other way. For example, if I if I get this minus two minus two, my string, this is a, the string that I'm accessing, I would like just the first five items. I write like this. I have the first five items because I'm starting from the very first beginning. I didn't specify anything. And I'm going to the fifth 
but remember that it's not the, the fifth, it stops in index number four, but index number four is the fifth. Is that's it. <laughs> uh, uh, item in my in my string. Okay, so this is a way of indexing uh, lists, and as you can see, I can create multi-dimensional uh, structures using just lists. Okay, and we can use the number of index that I need. Uh, as long as my list has all these inner lists or inner structures that can be accessed uh, internally, okay? But what if I would like to do something more complex with a list or some operation that uh, it's not provided here? <clears throat> For example, uh, I have LST, LST is a list, okay? If I'd like, for example, to insert a new item in the list, I don't know how to do it, but uh, Python has a very uh, important uh, functionality that is, it helps us automatically to, to check for functions, uh, internal functions or the manual, the help and all this kind of stuff. So if I get my list, uh, my LST, so type the list is, is a list, and I start to type LST point, it shows me all the functions or all the members that are connected to this object type. So if I do this, I can see all the functions that I can use in the list, okay? But you might be wondering, okay, Maurice, but I don't know what does it mean uh, index, for example. I don't know either. And if I don't know, I can just put a question mark at the end of the member. Uh, just a second. If I type this command, it will open for me a side window with the with the explanation so for example uh, this this is the signature what we call signature of the function how the function works what is it expecting so expecting a value a start and a stop and uh, return the first index of a value uh, and raises if the the value is not present so let's try it Point index. Uh, let's see one item that we have in the list. The number four we have in the list. Where? Number four. We have the list number four. The index is three. Okay, let's check. Okay, and I have the answer three. The other manner to, to access this help is putting the help function in front of any function that we have in Python. So if you just type help LST point append, for example, it gives me the help here at the, at the, at the bottom of the cell. So how does append work? Append, I put an object and it will append the object to the end of the list. So for example, if I have my list and I append a last element, and I call list, I have all the items I had before and one more item that is called last element and the length of the list is increased to seven and everything works fine. Mm -hmm. The very last thing about list that I didn't explain is that we can change the, the one item in the list for any other item and how do I do this is just indexing. For example, I did a mistake. My last item is not called last element. I would like to call just last. So I can put my variable, I can index it. So uh, list minus one is the last item. We can check it quickly. I can just put a, a hashtag as I 
told you the hashtag makes Py to understand that this is a comment. This is not to be to be uh, processed internally. Is my last element, and now I will get rid of the hashtag. And I will check what is my last item now. And you can see the last item is called last. OK, that's it. And we can do this that I am calling assessing object members for any other member or any other variable that we have. OK, for strings is the same. So for example, my string s, if you remember, s is a string, hello world, if I put as s point, it will return me a lot of different functions that I can use to operate in the strings. Split the string, or I can uh, use replace to replace a substring inside the string, partition. I don't know how to use all of them. Uh, but if I would like to know, it's just question mark. And then it's here the signature. For example, I pass the old string the new string and count is the maximum number of occurrences to, to, to change. So for example, if I'd like to put replace, I will change the hello, sorry, the old string is hello, I will change it for hi. It will, uh, sorry, it's like this. It will return me the high word instead of hello word. Okay? Uh, so we have uh, other members, for example, put everything in lowercase, swap the cases. Uh, another interesting is to check if any string is numeric. Uh, and everything works the same, the same way. A lot of these things that I'm showing here, you will have to try by yourselves when programming in Python or when trying. So I advise you to take this notebook and go through it and type yourself the, the shift enter in all of these cells and try to, to make different things or looking for different functions to, to get used to, to the language. Uh, As I told you, I'm not going through tuples or dictionaries or sets that are three also important structures that we have in, in, in Python. I will leave this for the next class. I'd like to talk today about the if statements and the flow control. That's the, the most important thing. <clears throat> if statements, probably uh, all of you have already, have already seen in, in, in the programming class in the university but we can control the flow of our execution. And the basic usage is if a condition, uh, sorry, if a condition and then executes what is in the condition, else executes uh, if the condition is not satisfied. I will show you an example. I think it's easier. Uh, for example, I would like to check if this number is even or this number is odd. Of course, this one is really easy to even uh, we can change this. Uh, and to check this, I'm going to use modulus, modulus 2. Modulus 2, remember, that is the reminder of the division. So if the reminder of the division by 2 is 0, it's even. Otherwise, it's odd. Uh, OK, so remember, I write a condition and else the flow if the condition is not satisfied. So here is if the condition is satisfied, and here is the con if the condition is not satisfied. OK, the other very, very, very important thing that we have to learn here in Python, different from other languages, is that we don't have anything to mark where are the blocks. What I mean by the blocks? Here I can have other computations. I don't know why. Let me just do a... Here uh, I can put other computations. For example, I can uh, print x. 
print x, for example. And here I can also print the x. Okay? Uh, and what I mean by block is all the code that has to be uh, processed if the condition happens. So, uh, usually when we are in C or other language, we need to put uh, curly brackets or other different stuff to define a block. For example, if you are programming in C or C++ or C Sharp or even Java, we should do something like this, okay? In Python, that's not the case because Python is sensitive to indenting. So uh, here we will learn that we have to indent our code. And indenting the code is just putting a tab uh, here and keep everything that we want to be processed in the block in the, in the same indentation. Okay? If you don't do this, it will raise an error. For example, here it says that uh, this print here it doesn't match my indentation. Okay? It's unindented. So I have to get rid of this unindented uh, command. Uh, okay, we have everything working. We have the if clause. That's the most important clause that we are going to use. Uh, we can use if if we would like this. The the simple if gives me just two outputs. I go through this flux or through this flux. But if uh, I would like to give more outputs, I can use instead of if else. I can use if elif, else if. Uh, for example, if I would like to check if the number is negative, positive, or zero. <clears throat> Here, I use, I'm using another command. It's not very common, but just to, to demonstrate. I can ask for an input. I can put min minus five. Minus five is negative. If I run again, I can put zero. Zero is zero. And positive number. Okay, I can put it here. I have the positive number. Uh, I do have else and I have elif. Elif is if it doesn't, the, the flow works like this. First, it checks for this condition. If this condition is true, it goes through the, the very first block and then exit. And the exit, it will process the other block. For example, if I print uh, finish, it will go pass through finish. Okay? Uh, and elif, it means else, but if this condition is met. So like elif is a kind of else that has another condition if uh, inside it. So if it's not the first condition, but it is the second condition, it does this block here. And else, it's, it's, it means if none of the conditions above are met, it has to go to the last, to the last block. And I can put the number of elifs I want, okay? So I can create this as complex as I want. And we don't want to create anything very complex because it's difficult to, to understand. So we'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, so this is the basic flow control. Uh, the other structure that is important is the while. The while is very good for counting uh, because uh, it means that while a condition, any condition, and when, when I mean any condition, it uh, means uh, any operation or that returns a true or a false, okay? Anything that returns a true or a false. For example, I can put zero here. Yes, I can, because zero is false. If he tries to, 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 to convert from, from integer to, to false, to, to Boolean, okay? So uh, while is really good for counting and uh, for example, if I would like to count from 1 to 1,000, I can put while start uh, is lower than end, it will print start. And then I, I cannot forget to put start equals start plus 1, otherwise, 
otherwise uh, my loop will never uh, exit the loop because I need the start to surpass or to overcome the, the end at least once to exit the loop. So uh, this is our really very first loop in, uh, in Python. Very simple. Uh, in the next classes I will teach you that it, that's not something we should do in Python. You should avoid at all costs doing something like this because Python is really slow for this kind of operation and we have to rely on something more uh, uh, created more specifically to, to, to managing these kind of loops or operations. Okay, but this is our very first, very first loop in Python. Okay, let's go. Uh, but the, our loop counting is not very interesting. I can put, I can combine everything. I can combine, for example, the while with the the if, and never forgetting the indentation. For example, in this case, I am going to start with i equals zero. Uh, and I will go to 100. Don't forget that every step I have to increment the i, so i equals i plus 1. And what I'm going to, to check here if the number is divisible by 3. Okay, so here I have all the numbers that are divisible by 3. Or the remainder of the operation is 0. Okay, it's not just even numbers. Numbers divide, divisible by three. Okay, so that's what we have here. Uh, but what if we would like to create a list with all the numbers divisible by three from zero to to one hundred? Not a problem. Uh, I will do the counts in the same way. I will start with a number. I'm calling the current number. I will declare create a list, an empty list. If I do this, I'm just creating a list with, without any elements inside of it. I'm calling it LST. Uh, I will do the loop as before. And each time the division has no reminder, I will append the element, the current number, to my list. And then I'm going to output the result of the list. And then I have a list with these results. Why is it important? Because here it showed me the results, but I didn't capture the results to process afterwards. And now I have the results to, to process afterwards. Okay. Uh, and, and then we can think of any other interesting stuff to uh, or similar stuff here. Okay, I'm going to jump this part. That's uh, something that it's uh, interesting because I'm going to show you now how we would iterate through a list the old style. What I mean by old style, if you are programming C, for example, or Java. Now, Java, I think it has uh, the, the list, but older program like Pascal <laughs> uh, uh, or other lang older languages, for example, to, to iterate through a list we needed to do something like this. We needed to start with a counter. We needed to create a while loop. And the while loop will end when my iterator is greater or equal than the length of the list. And for example, like this, I'm going to get the squares of the numbers in the list. OK, I'm getting the squares of these numbers. OK, so this is the iteration I call old style, old style program. If you are a, pro, a Fortran programmer, probably you are doing something like this in your programs. But that's not Pythonic. And you will read a lot of Pythonic way of writing code. Who... Ty, do you, do you have anything? Oh, sorry. Ty had one question. Ty? Yeah, I put it on the chat. Ah, okay, it's on the chat here. Great. Okay, Ty is 
asking what is yeah thanks ty i put here to to teach you but i i just went through quickly through here uh plus equals is the same as for example instead of let me see what is i is 34 if i would like to increment i by one i can write i equal i plus one because it will first solve the right side and then it will do the assignment uh, and then i will be 35 i plus equals is just a quicker way of saying this okay and then it will increment i by one 36 now uh, i can use this for two for example 38 okay so it's the same as current number equals current number plus this number that's another simple arithmetic construction. Okay, not not complex, but uh, yeah, we have to explain. Uh, where I was? Okay, I was teaching about the old way, old school of uh, <laughs> uh, going through going through a list. And why I explain this now? Because just after I'm gonna talk to you about the for statement that is the last uh, construction that I'm gonna teach today and the for statement is to go through a list uh, not only a list you can go through anything that can be indexed for example a string can be indexed I can go through a string okay and to do this I can uh, use the 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 for the for statement. The for statement is really different from other languages. This is where things start to get different from other languages, because uh, the for statement in in uh, in Python is just for iterating through a structure that is iterable. For example, strings, lists, and afterwards we're going to see that matrix are iterable. Anything that can be indexed. Okay. So, uh, why is it so different from other languages? I have a slide here just to, to show you the difference. Uh, let me put it here. Okay. If we are from other languages, for example, C, C++, or Fortran, to, to go through a list, or to, to not to go through a list, but to do a for statement we should do something like this for i initialize a variable here e equals zero and then i put a condition uh, as long as this condition is satisfied it will increment my uh, number and then it will do something and that's similar for for Trump. for example i can start with e i equals 10 to 1 doing minus 2 each step so this I will start with 10 and then go to 8 and then go to 6 and then do something and then I finish my for statement. This is a kind of while and this is the for statement for set. But in Python, what we will learn here is that uh, it has to be something that is indexable to do a for statement. It's not possible in Python to say for e equals 1, 2, 100 okay it doesn't work it doesn't work it will never work in python because python is not to be used like this uh, the for is to be used with lists or anything that can be indexed or terrible so for example uh, my last list was i don't remember was the the squares so I will, it doesn't matter what I write here, I put just I. I will go through my list. I don't, I don't even remember what is my list. I have to, <laughs> to put it here. Okay, I have a list to 99. And then what I'm going to do here is that I will go through a list and then I will get the squares. Okay. So, what is the syntax for? I put any variable I want, I can put anything here, and then anything 
will be available for me to do the processing. For example, anything divided by two. Uh, it doesn't matter this name. This name is just to represent each item in the list that it will be uh, used for each for loop that is doing here. For example, so for anything, it will go through each item of the list. Okay? Uh, so that's how the for statement works in, in Python. And uh, I already showed you how is it different from other, from other languages. And if I would like to use the for statements as you are used to in uh, other languages, so other languages, you have to do another command that is a range. Range creates a range from the first item, the, the start, the end, and the step. Okay, so it's good to write it here for you. So range is start and step. If I do this command, I start with 10. I end in zero, but remember all the indexing in, in Python always excludes the, the last item and my step is minus two, so I stop in two and I started with 10. Okay, great. Uh, we know the very basics. If we, uh, if we are really uh, interested in, in using just this, we could create magnificent stuff with this because this is the basic that is in machine code or uh, machine language and we can do almost everything with just these really small concepts that I have teach you today. Uh, for example, in the past, when I, when I was younger, I used to, I started to learn the, the machine language. And machine language of a, a processor is just multiplication and sum and subtraction and these kind of loops. So with this, we can create everything. If you have seen the, the video that I, that I posted in, in the email, a lot of those guys, they started with this, with just these small blocks and these. And to show you that this, it really works, I will give the exercise, the last part of the, for the lesson today. Uh, for the exercise, uh, I will use a package. I, I didn't want to use any package today, but uh, I have to because I'm not uh, creating something from directly. Uh, but I will uh, use it and afterwards I'm going to explain you how to install the package and how to create our environment and everything. But today is just this. We, we are going to see how uh, all these pieces can work together for something interesting for us. Uh, so I will import a package. That's a package called random. Remember what I told you? Uh, if I want anything, I have to, to, to look for uh, a package to do that. So uh, I will not create a way to, to output random variables. There is a package for it. And I'm going to use the function called randint, that is uh, random integer. Okay, return the random integer between a range between A and uh, A and B. And notice that here it's including both endpoints. So it's including A and it's including B. It's important for us. Okay. And what I'm going to create, I will create the precipitation for one month. Okay, I will create the, the just the sample data. It's not a real precipitation data. Uh, for that, what we should do, uh, the random seed, you don't, we don't need the random seed. Random seed is just for the, the notebooks that we use will have the same result as mine. Okay, if I use a random seed, I am assuring that the, the, the random numbers will be the same, okay? And they will not be completely random. As I saw that this result was good for me, I just put one, the result uh, was good, and then I, I fixed one. But I could put any other integer here as a seed for the random number, or I could just comment this, this line uh, uh, and don't use any, any random seed at all. Okay, so you don't have to, to, but it's just for you to receive the notebook with the same example. 
Okay, I will create two lists. One is the daily rain, and the other one is the day of the month. Okay, I have two different lists. And then I would like to go from day one to day 31. To go to the day 31, remember I have to go uh, to 32 to stop in 31, because that's, that's how it works. <clears throat> and the step is one. Uh, for the list day of month, I will append just the item that is in my range, the variable that I'm picking, that I'm using in the for, for clause. And for the daily range, I'm going to append a random integer. So I saw here how random int functions. I just pass two numbers, two, two endpoints, and then it gives me a number uh, between those endpoints, a random number. Like this, like this, we can have uh, a sample of what would be a uh, uh, daily rain of a month. And here I'm taking uh, use of another important package in, in, in Python, that is the matplotlib by plot you don't have to, to bother with that now just if you but afterwards I, I will have, give a, a class specifically for for the matplotlib but here's just for us to, to take a look the real command is here I, I'm important I'm importing uh, a package giving the name for this package I'm importing this as the name plt and then I'm putting plt creating a bar I'm passing the x and then I'm passing the, the value that I would like to show in the bar. And then it gives me the daily rain, for example, if I would like to work with daily rain. Okay, and see that uh, these were done just using uh, lists. I just have two lists. And I can extend this concept. And for example, I could use this to create the river stage, for example. Or I, I could use the, the, this concept to create anything I would like to. For example, the, the weight of the students in the college, or the height of the students in the college, or anything that we want. Okay, just using this concept of lists uh, that I have explained. And I will have some questions in the, in the, in the notebook for you to, to try to, to find the answers. For example, if I would like to, to check the number of days with rain, how would, would we do this? Uh, we have to go through the list and make the computations accordingly. If we would like to, to check what is the day of the maximum rain, it's another good question for us. It's important for someone who works in, with uh, hydrology or meteor meteorology. Another question is the total rain. What would be the total rain? And the mean rain. So, uh, because of this question, that's why I used the seed, and I would like you to use the seed as well, because with the seed, we can all have the same answers. Otherwise, <laughs> each of you would have completely different answers for the same, uh, for the same exercise. Okay, guys, uh, it's been almost two hours that we started, one hour and a half that we really started. Uh, there is some extra, it, it's really cool, I did this with my son, uh, it's just to show, but I think you can go through it by yourselves, it's just to show that we can create any dimensional matrix just using what I showed you today. So, this is just an example, I'm creating here a checkerboard. Uh, I show uh, how to create, uh, you see that the, the variable m, it's a combination of two lists, I, I, I put here uh, eight lists, eight different lists, and I combine the eight lists in just one list, it, it, it's interesting, and, and I called it a variable m, and we can see that m is a bidimensional matrix, but Python doesn't know yet that it's a bidimensional matrix, it does, it just understand that this is a list of lists, uh, but I can index like a matrix, okay? And I can do slice and I can do anything that I want here. If I put type M2, is, this, is the third line 
in this matrix. But you have to understand this concept because this is the same concept uh, to work with matrices with NumPy, that is the core uh, package for matrix, uh, for matrix multiplication or for matrix uh, operations in Python, <clears throat> okay? But we can do uh, really nice stuff here with PLT, I am show, I put other examples here for you to amuse yourselves uh, during the free time. <clears throat> for example, here I created a checkerboard uh, just instead of putting all the, the numbers by myself, I just created two for loops to check if they are odd or not. I, I, don't, I don't remember the, the logic that, that I did here, but you can, you can go through it by yourselves. It's just a, an example. And then here I showed how to create a, a degradé, a, a range of colors. Uh, in this. And th th this, is, this is really important for those, for example, who will be working with satellite images, uh, I, I, I would suggest to go through the, the, these extra, uh, these extra cells here that I created for you to, to, as I told you, for you to amuse yourself, selves with this, okay? But uh, uh, in the next, uh, in the next lesson next week, I'm going to talk about. Uh, the other structures that will increase the repertoire of the repertory of uh, uh, things, nice things that we can do in, in Python and just using the collab. For example, next week we are going to see dictionaries and we are see how to create a function and that's important for you to start developing the code. Today is really just, just the, the, the very basics for you and uh, do you have any any questions or any comments on this and okay so for those who, who are following uh, well I think you, you just go through the, the notebook if, if you have no problem with the, the commands and the, the logic you can just skip it but <clears throat> it would be interesting to to try to make the the exercise just to Okay, guys, thank you very much. Anyone has anything thank to say? You. Okay, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Maurice. Andrea, I didn't talk to you, but. Uh, thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Mauricio. Bye, -bye. Thank you, Mauricio. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you, Mauricio. Bye bye. Good bye, -bye. Night. See you next week. Bye. See bye, -bye. you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bonsoir. Merci.